Hello everybody, hope you're doing well. So today we're going to go through a little bit of history on gun flint making and I'm going to show you the French and English version of napping. We'll kind of go over some tools and stuff like that. Now we're going to try to work up a couple of gun flints. So I'm not great at reading things and retaining so generally what I do is I just take notes and create like an outline and go that route. So majority of my information that I'm getting from comes from online articles and then also this book here. The book is titled, as you can see it's a very long title, is titled On the Manufacture of Gun Flints, The Methods of Excavating for Flint, The Age of Paleolithic Man, and the Connection Between Neolithic Art and the Gun Flint Trade. So this is where I get got a bulk of my information. So when you go through this book, it talks about Brandon England and the, and the nappers of that time period. And then it also goes through some of the tooling. Okay, so this is, this is the, let's see if I can get close enough now. The text is backwards, so this is a flaking hammer, commonly used. Um, I believe it was a bastard file that they forged down and put on a, hand, uh, put on a handle. And this is what they were used for flaking. This one here, I believe, is called a English flaking hammer. So that is just a chunk of steel tapered on both ends. And I think there's one that's even finer than that. So it looks like they had multiple sizes of flaking hammers. And what I did in order to get my tools made is I scaled and then kind of came up with my own dimensions. And I'll share those with you here in just a little bit. So I'm going to go through just a quick bit of history here. i got some notes. Maybe if I have my outline here. Here we go. So this is what I did. So I do reenactments and I also do um, demonstrations at those reenactments. But I can't ever seem to remember this stuff. So I'm just going to read you my notes. So the, it's titled Gunflint Use in Manufacture History. So pre-flintlock rifle, the matchlock rifle, was in the Americas approximately 1607 to 1640. The matchlock rifle used a lit wick to ignite the powder. It was slow to reload, match could be seen at night, and it was hard to keep lit in the rain. So then the flintlocks arrived in America around 1620 to the 1800s. Gunpowder and flint at that time came from England. Gunflint manufacturing in England didn't start until the late 1600s. Professionally made gun flints were rarely found in America. Settlers with a need for gun flints, American settlers, napped their own flint. Sorry, they napped their own flints from using ship's ballast. Um, what was common for ballast in the bottom of ships? Uh, it's the weight, and it helps with um, stability, I believe. Um, they used flint from England. Gun flints were made by shaping flakes knocked off of a cobble, so that's kind of what we would call the American style of napping, or I believe even the Dutch. It's basically where you take a rock and you knock off flakes. Um, I think I have a diagram here I can show you. Here you go. So the text is backwards, so this would be the English version. Well, not English, but this would be the American version. So they took a rock and they knocked off flakes and created this shape here and then they trimmed it. So they, these are also called gun spalls and were pretty common in the early periods of America. And then this is the French and English version which we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the gun flints were made, the gun flints that were made were crudely shaped, sometimes called gun spalls. By the late 1600s professionally made gun flints were readily available. So by the late 1600s, that means that <clears throat> the manufacturing of gun flints was underway, and all gun flints at that point in time were then imported into America. So the French gun flint method, which is the one that uses the blade core technology, uh, was figured out by 1710, approximately. Um, so the French had abundant, high-quality flint sources. The French also relied on a bunch of small artisan shops to create their gun flints. So a lot of mom and pop shops. 
Uh, the French method uses re redeveloped ancient blade core technology. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Peter Viking or Viking. I'm not sure how he pronounces it, but he uses a um, he uses a antler uh, an antler uh, rod and then smacks it with a wooden billet and he drives off flakes, similar to what they do here. Now this was done with a steel hammer, but the the process is still the same with the uh, driving a piece of antler. Uh, Peter Wiking has a lot of good videos. Uh, W-I-K-I-N-G. And then you can also look up um, Will Lord. He does some stuff like this as well. So um, the French method uses redeveloped ancient blade core technology, which is the image I showed you. It was fast and efficient, and at that time it was the best flints, best quality flints in the world. So the British gun flint industry pre-1972 approximately. The gunflint industry was across half of Britain near ports and naval bases. Um, there was a poor flint quality because they were just using whatever they could find and it was made with the inefficient English method, American method, uh, made from a single shaped flake. Um, so that is where the term gunspall came from. So then the British gunflint industry ranged from 1792 to 1815 approximately. The whole industry, the whole napping industry, moved to Brandon, England. Near Grimes Graves Mine, it's the highest highest quality flint mine in the world. The English method was abandoned and a modified French method was used. So the blade core technology and then they used the English hammer and then the flaking hammer. The French method was introduced by French prisoners cir circa 1780 to 1800s or possibly by English spies. The Brandon method is a square hammer and a block versus a round hammer during the final stages of napping. So apparently the French were using a round end hammer, maybe something like a ball peen, and they were still using, I believe, the stake. Um, the Brandon method was three times faster than the French method, three gun flints from a blade versus one, which is crazy because I can barely get two out of one. Um, after the Neapolic, Napoleonic Wars, Brandon, England, gained a monopoly on the world's gun flint supply, and I wrote worlds in capital, the worlds, thanks to flint quality, quality of workmanship, and manufacture speed. Brandon, England, Brandon employed 200 flint nappers and exported 1.5 million flints per month. At a top speed, flint nappers could make 8 flints per minute. Several million flints could be made by one small workshop. Um, and then another note I added in here. So the life expectancy of a flint napper was only 46 um, during the gun flint manufacturing stage instead of the what the lifespan then was 64 due to silicosis or nappers rot because these guys were sitting in a small dimly lit room dimly lit room poorly ventilated many nappers and they were just chugging through this stuff and they were just ingesting so much silica so we're near the end and then we'll get into some napping so the future of the Brandon Flint industry 1850 to 1980 the peace of 1815 and the invention of the percussion cap, 1822, started to cause an industrial decline. Nappers produced such high qualities of flint that the market was oversupplied and prices were rock bottom. In the 1860s, Brandon evolved to aid archaeologists, journalists, and tourists on flint napping. By the late 1800s, military gun flints were no longer needed. Brandon constantly innovated new wares, jewelry, ornaments, decorations, artifact reproduction. Um, Brandon also got into the construction industry making flint bricks and facings, which is a pretty common thing to find in England. And then the last Brandon flint napper died in 1980. He made gun flints for reenactors and black powder shooters until his death. His name was Fred Avery. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some references here. So I got information from an online article called From Cobble to Gun, Making Do in Early Maryland. Um, I got some more information that's written by Henry M. Miller. And then Mark W. Moore, uh, Museum of Stone Tools. 
Um, and then there was a blogger, his name was Paul, uh, Prehistorics Flint Napping in the UK. That's where I got a lot of the uh, Brandon England information outside of the book. Um, and then Sydney B. J. Sketcherly is the long title on the manufacture of gun flints, da 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 da. And then uh, regional archaeologist, and it was about Alberta historic places uh, from Todd Christ, Christ, Christensen. Apologies on butchering your last name. So that's pretty much the history. I don't, like I said, I'm not great with memorizing that stuff. And then also talking it through is a bit of a difficulty. But I can show you how to do it. I'm a monkey see, monkey do kind of guy. So basically what, what was happening with the French and the English modified English method was they were taking a, a rock, um, a cobble with a flat face, and then they were driving blades off of the core. That's called a core. So this is a description of the blade. And then what they would do with the square hammer is they would try they would try to break it and shear it and then do a rough shaping to get your final gun flint. The American method, I call Amer it's English American, it's it's North American, right? So they took the cobble which I think they were doing this in other places, so this isn't strictly North American. I'm just, to help get everyone on the same page, this is what we were doing here when we first got here. So what we were doing is we were driving flakes off, much like how you would nap um, for making a projectile point, and then they were shaping it into crude squares. I know how they were doing this. They were using a flaking hammer. I don't know how they were getting to here. I haven't found anything written about how they did the final shaping. Did they use a stake in a square? I have no idea. So, okay, it's enough of that. So now to get into more of the tooling side of things. So these particular tools that I had made by a blacksmith. Um, so the first thing that you're gonna need and it's pretty important is a staking, uh, sorry, a napping hammer. I was reading this, but saying this actually flip that so this is the flat hammer uh, for napping so that is what I had them make out of this here so this is a piece of mild steel um, I just had him shape it he ended up making it thicker in the middle and then here's what we got so the dimensions if you guys want to make your own and this is pretty comfortable the dimensions are I should have grabbed a tape measure I don't have a tape measure handy, so we'll just wing it here. So the width, I have it at one inch wide, quarter inch thick, nine sixteenths thick near the head. And I think the length is six and a half inches. Yeah, so the length is six and a half. The handle can be whatever you want it to be, but my handle is about seven inches, okay? So this is the napping hammer. This is probably the hammer you're going to use the most when it comes to shaping. Now when it comes to the flaking hammer, it's the tapered one here. Let's find my book. i got to hurry up or I'm going to run out of time and not be able to show you guys how this stuff works here. So the napping hammer, well, they call it the flaking hammer, forgive me. This is what the flaking hammer looks like. And I scaled the picture and... Um, so it was inch and a half by four, I believe, and it's a little heavy. I should have went a little bit smaller. Maybe uh, one by one would work, but here's your napping hammer. You can see it's well loved, and I kept it kind of loose so I can flip this head. So the length, I figured four inches. It's a chunky boy. Uh, yep, four inches by, I believe, inch and a half square. Yep, inch and a half square. I would probably go down to maybe one inch square, inch and a quarter square, and then maybe make this five or six inches long. Nah, yeah, maybe five inches. So probably go one, one and a quarter by one and a quarter, and then make this probably five inches, just to give it a little bit more extra. And then the handle, again, I this is just a black locust stick. It's probably around 10 inches long. Okay. So then the final piece of the puzzle is the stake. Now the way they describe putting the stake in, I did not do. I don't have time for that. Um, 
So the stake looks like this, and again, I had to scale the pictures in this book with a ruler. And I had the, the blacksmith make it for me. And I'm going to angle you down so you can kind of see. Oop, I'm going to angle you. Okay, I'm going to pick up the phone. So here's what we got. So this is the stake. I can turn the log here. Oh, sorry. So you can see right here, here's your stake embedded in the log. This stake, I believe, is six inches long. Let me put you back here. Hi. You guys don't get to see my face very often. So the stake itself is six inches long, and it's one by one square. Yep. And then this is half by, I think I did, uh, let's see here, by inch and three quarter. You could probably go two. And it's basically what it is. I drilled a one inch. No, I did a... What did I do? I think I did... No, I did a one inch diameter hole and then I used a hammer and chisel and I cut it in square. The instructions in the book say you heat this red hot, you drive it into the log, let it burn in, you pull it out, and then you add some leather paddings because you don't want this to strike solid according to the old book. And then it had some rawhide and some tie downs. It's, it's in the book. Um, I highly recommend buying this book if you are interested in this kind of stuff. So that's pretty much what we got cooking. Um, the log, it isn't anything fancy. It's a log that a friend gave me. Um, but I would want it a comfortable working height for you if you're sitting. You don't want to be too low. You don't want to be too high. But this one's actually fairly comfortable. I didn't have to cut it. It's just the way it came. And typically their logs would have been much larger in diameter. But I take this to reenactments and I wasn't going to carry around a three foot wide log um, and do that. So. We're going to go ahead and try to get into some napping real fast here. If you guys have any questions, I know I went through this kind of quick. Just shoot me something in the comments and I'll do my best. I'm not a professional YouTuber. This is this YouTube channel was just me going, you know what? I'm doing this. I might as well share it and kind of show people what we got going on here. So, I'm not... Not interested in being a YouTube star. I just figured I would share my journey with people if they were interested. Okay, so we got these. Now I would like to show you how to use the flaking hammer, but I don't have any rocks big enough for a blade core, um, and I pretty much ruined all those. So I am looking for one laying around. I thought I grabbed it out for today, but I must have forgotten. But anywho, well, let's see if it's in here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So here is an example of a blade core. Now I didn't do a good job because I'm still learning. But you can see it's got a flat top and here's your blade core. Now when they were driving flakes, I might be able to show you one. But I keep this to show people. Um, it's more cost efficient for me to do um, other things. So we're going to go ahead and try to drive a blade. And what you want to do is follow a ridge for a blade. And again, I'm not an expert. You can watch Will Lord's channel, and he runs fantastic blades. I actually emailed him, asked him what he recommended, and he goes, it's all about material, honestly. Um, and he's got access to the best material in the world. So... <laughs> We do what we can. This is a piece of Georgetown, if you're curious. So we're going to go ahead and try to run a blade here. Move this just slightly out of the way so you can see. Grab my safety glasses. I'm going to try to run a blade for you guys. So what we're going to do... And you have to assume that pressure flaking wasn't really a thing used. So we're just going to trim this back just a little bit because it's a little overhung. I have to cut myself like a dingleberry. So I want to drive this, but this platform is all wonky, so I don't know if it's going to work. So maybe we'll try this one right here. We'll see if we can knock a little blade off. So basically they held it on their leg, put their finger near the back, and then you're just trying to boop it. Oops. Helps if you hit where you're aiming. And then I just crumbled it. So bear with me a second. Come on now. 
making me look bad. There we go. So here's a tiny little blade. Okay. Now just amplify it, and that's what they were doing. They were making it much bigger and much better. There's a YouTube video on uh, Brandon England napping, and that one I watched a couple of times, and those guys just blazed through. So I'm going to try to knock off a bigger blade right here. There we go. Well, it broke, but... So there's definitely gun flint in there, right? Let's see if we can get another one. So that one's sheared off here. So maybe we can get another one over here. Maybe right here. That was a nice thin one there. It's not very long. Blade core isn't that big. So we're going to come in a little bit. That didn't work. Try right here. Ah, that one broke. It was a good length, but it shattered into three pieces. So let's just come over. Let's try right here. Let's try right here. Hmm. Okay, let's try right here. Okay, let's try right here. Nope. Okay, let's try right here. That's better. And then here's another blade. Okay. So just learn and do better and you can do that. <laughs> I'm not that I'm not very talented with this. It's more cost efficient. It's more efficient for me to reach out to someone and buy uh, pre-made blades than it is and then to shear them. So here's some examples of some good gunflint blades. So there's probably a few gunflints hiding in here. So, 20 minutes of jabber drilling. Sorry. This one's probably a little too thin, but there might be something in there. If anything, it's good practice. Okay. So, we'll go ahead and try to trim these up. Alright, let's see here. So, I have to turn it this way. And I think I'm going to move you guys over here. So you can see, I can't do it this way. I'm sitting this way, so we're going to adjust here. Hopefully I don't drop yet. Here we go. Hang on. Let's see if we can get in. Ooh, there you go. There's a pretty good angle. All right. So I'm going to do my best not to put my fat hand in the way. Let's see. Oh, look at that. Big old fat hand right in the way. So I need you on the other side. Okay. One second. I gotta move some rocks around here. Let's see. Here we go. Hi. Don't mind the mess. I have a lot of things going on. Okay. So I think that is an okay angle for you guys. There we go. Hopefully that works for you guys. So when you do your trimming, you want to put your ridge down. Okay. Now hopefully you guys can see. So we're going to do this thin one for practice. So what we're doing, I'm going to angle this slightly. Hopefully you guys can see. Hey, there we go. That's a good angle. So then what we're going to do is we're using this edge, and we're not trying to hit way out here. We're trying to aim right on that corner. So as you can see right there, that's the end we're trying to hit for a shear. And then you're just gently trimming it up, okay? Now your blade edges, these edges are your working edges for striker flint. And then your ridge should run parallel to your working edges. So we're going to go ahead and try to trim this now. And what I like to do is I like to hold the piece before I cut it. So I'll hold it and then I'll kind of tap, wait till it feels solid and I don't feel much reverberation here. And then I'll just give it a whack. Okay, so there we go. We had a pretty decent clear, clean shear. So then we're going to go like this. And then we're going to gently flip this around and we're going to try to get it square. We're just, we're just working this edge in now. in here 
So that actually sheared pretty decent. A lot of times what they'll hap what'll happen, whoops, is it'll shear crooked or it'll split the flake. So here. And then there we have our little gun flint. And it's actually fairly thin. I don't know what whoop. I don't know what size it is. Sorry for my fat head being in the way. So let's check size. So we're at 13 sixteenths by 7 eighths. So 3 quarter 7 eighths is a pretty standard flint size. And that is subjective to your blade width. So if your blade width is too narrow, you're not going to get a 1 inch. So this one here is an inch and 3. So we should be able to get a 1 inch long flint. So we're going to hold the part we want to keep and we're going to shear off then we don't want. You can see there's a bulge here, which technically would be a flint right in here for this end because this would be more of a gun spall type. So I was talking, not looking at the camera. I'm sorry. So if we shear this, we might be able to get a spall. Give it a tap. There it goes. So that's sheared off nicely. So we're going to go ahead and trim it up a little bit. Hopefully this angle helps you guys visualize so I like to hold these two fingers here and I use my finger as like a wedge as you can see here if you look right here my fingers in between and I can hold it really good and solid and then we just trim the edges in gently and it's a, like a dragging it's just a drag right we're basically hitting the face not the edges we're just trying to drag it and you can hear it so now we're gonna trim this up so we're gonna hold it right here Start with our longest end. Try to keep it square. So there's that side, and we're going to turn it around. Now, if for some reason your size isn't quite right, you can always touch it up with a pressure flaker. So here's another gun flint. And this one is... This one is 13 sixteenths by... 15 so there's a three quarter by one. I think you would be okay with that and you can see a ridge right down the middle There's your size So I'm gonna put that on the table back here. Let's do it again This one isn't ideal, but it could be a one-sided flint. You can see it's squared off here It's a bit bananaed. Well a little bit right here. So we might be able to get a flint out of this It's just not Perfect, so we're gonna hold what we want to keep and we're gonna break off what we don't want so we're just going to tap, see how it sheared, see how it sheared at an angle. Sometimes that can really bug you up, bunk you up, mess you up. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Or you see that, that corner blew out. That happens all the time. It's worse when it's thicker. When it's thick, it's a pain. And you're not trying to wail on it. You're just trying to get a pretty quick shape. So this one's more of a wedge type, which I think will be okay, but we'll see. It's a little bit. So that is a 15 by 3 quarter. So that was a pretty good eyeball. And we might be able to take a pressure flaker and run that corner so we could probably thin that out a little bit but there's a good wedge end there so that's usable let's do it again i enjoy it i think it's so much fun so here we got to get rid of it up about in here and you can see where it's got a sweep right here so we're going to try to fracture it right above that sweep we'll flip it upside down we want it right in here which I'm going to work it up. This is all trash, so I'm just going to trim. Instead of trying to fracture, I'm going to just trim. Safety glasses are super handy. So you can see we're still twisted. This is lower, so we're going to keep trimming it. So we still got to go in. We're looking for that flat spot. There we go. That looks much better. Nice and flat. We're going to flip it. We're going to try to trim this guy in. 
which we're just going to nibble away at it. wearing it <laughs> it's going everywhere so here's where we're at so far we're getting it worked in this is could be a big flint like a like a um old best flint just a big one it's thick let's see how thick we are yeah we're a quarter should be okay so we're gonna keep pulling this in because we're well over three quarter we're at one by one which is a flint size so we could just trim this to one by one and leave it alone which we might do that and then trim another it's not very often you're going to get a one inch flint a one inch square flint so i might as well save it somebody might need it although this has got a bit of a twist to it so we might trim it anyway yeah we're going to trim it anyway Oh well, never mind. Ignore my previous comment. So we're going to just keep trimming that up. And all your power is in your wrist, it's not in your elbow. If you start throwing elbows in, it's probably going to mess up. So that's 7 eighths by 1 and a 16 So we can come in just a little bit more. Um, now, the nappers at Brandon, they didn't measure. From what I understand, they didn't measure anything. They eyeballed everything. Oop, where are you going? Get back here. So we're probably going to leave this width alone as is. We'll trim this side up because it's a little bit wonky. I think that's a usable flint. So here's this one. Not too bad. Dimensions, I think, are 7 eighths by 1. Which is pretty close. Close enough, I believe. I don't think he would... I don't think that he would be unhappy with that. So that's three flints there. Let's see what else we can do. So we might have one right in here. This is a little thin, though. So we'll go ahead and trim this guy up to about here. Because we're just a little too thin. So that's got a cup to it. I don't know if I'll be able to pull that out. So we might have to trim it all the way back. But we'll we'll try to fracture it right on the hump and see if it flattens out. Okay. So this this happens often. Somebody's calling me. Let me turn that off here. So this will happen. So I went to fracture it and it split. This happens. Just it is what it is. So we're going to let that go away. So let's see what else we got here. Mm -hmm. This is not ideal, but we might be able to make it work. So this would probably end up being a smaller flint. See, there's your sharp edges. So square this way, so we'll trim it up this way. You guys can see okay. This one's a little wonky. So I'm not sure. This is just probably good trimming practice right now. I don't think this is going to be a one inch flint either. Try to give this a good, good trimming. Yeah, this one's got this one's got a twist and a ring and all kinds of stuff. Maybe we can trim it up this way. Let's try. Oop, where are you going? Come back here. Yeah, this one is non-ideal. Come on. Let's 
Yeah, this is not a good one. This one's weird. So that one's a three quarter seven eighths. I might be able to clean this up with pressure flaking, but we're not going to do that today. All right, let's grab one more blade and see if we can make another one. You can also use regular flakes too. Let's let's maybe do that, which I think I've shown you in previous videos. But let me see what I can do here. Maybe if I can find a flake. yourself dummy okay so here's a flake that we might be able to utilize might be a chunky flint but it's not the end of the world so we're gonna try to get the ridge to run parallel to the cutting edge I'm gonna try to trim this guy up now I'm not an expert um, this is just what I've learned so far. There's not a whole lot of information on YouTube about how to make gun flints. I mean, there is, but not, not enough, in my opinion. Let's see here, so there's that, and we're going to flip it. This guy is going to be a chunky boy. Maybe. <laughs> I'm just going to bend my thing. Here. There it goes. I don't know if you could see the dust on the camera, but that's why people were dying at 46. Imagine eight other guys doing this in the room, same room you're in. Be probably the equivalent of a stand up comedian at a bar that allows smoking. Maybe not. I don't know. Oh, that one fractured weird. It's alright, we'll just throw that out. No big deal. Let's see what we got down here. There might be a flint right here. Nope, that one's sweat. So you're looking for a fairly flat, say that five times fast, fairly flat flake. So here's a good example. We'll try to knock this one out for you real good. So you got your cutting edge, you got a ridge. So you should be able to, we should be able to get a flint out of this guy. In theory. So we're going to try, we're going to square this up first to the ridge. This is this is not an eight flint per minute pace by any means. And we went right down my shirt. Yeah, these thick ones are kind of a pain. But we're getting there. Might have to flip it this way for a little bit. Flip it back over. Use some of our what happened skills. Okay. So there's where we're at so far. Timer's going off, so this will be the last flint. See if we can make it a good one. Let me turn that timer off so I can see the camera. Boink. Let's trim this up just a little bit more. Let's see what we got. This is a piece of Texas shirt. So we're at 7 eighths by 15 sixteenths.
We could probably trim this just a little bit more. Maybe. Yeah, maybe this side. Sometimes if you're not careful, you can just break the corner off and it'll be bigger than what you wanted. And I'd rather leave it a little wide. But for perfection's sake. Okay, let's see what we got here. Hair under 7 eighths, we'll leave it alone. Hair under 1. Nice cutting edge here. And I think this edge will spark as well. So maybe a twofer. So we got got a few flints done here so we got and they're not too terribly off we'll try to fix this one a little bit nicer with pressure but we got our four flints here and I thought I had another one that was going to be a three-quarter oh here it is this one here three oh no wait that's the weird one I don't know where that one went I oh here we go and then here's the three-quarter seven-eighths one right here so Not bad. Uh, five usable flints. Way slower. Way slower than the Brad and Flint Napping guys. But, you know, it is what it is. I don't have access to, you know, European Flint and, you know, the knowledge base. These guys were trained up. I think a lot, I think what I was, if I was reading right, a lot of time in the book, they actually talk about how they take blades that aren't weren't great and they gave them to the apprentices to shape as practice so they weren't wrecking good blades um, but check out that book um I'll, if i can remember i'll put a link in there in the description for it for you guys but i appreciate your guys' time thanks for watching and uh hopefully you guys get something out of this thanks bye